Yeah, this is the logic tutor. Um, uh, we are going to observe a uh, chemistry alternative to practical today. If you have not subscribed, please make use of the subscribe button and click on also the bell icon beside it to notify you when we drop our new video. So we are going to concentrate on alternative to practical chemistry of uh, the year November, December 1993. And normally chemistry practical do consist of the titration, the salt analysis or qualitative test and we have the third part of it third part of the question which is uh, practical so, I mean theoretical works and most of it is explanation based on a particular reaction and some other questions so we're going to solve the one of the year 1993 see how it goes our alternative to practical is being done alternative to practical in chemistry is just like using the practical knowledge to answer a question that is a practical question in the absence of the experiment meaning you have performed the experiment and you know what it takes to do the experiment and you know what the, uh, the experiment entails so now can you now solve a practical question without performing the experiment so that is what alternative to practical is and that is how it is being done so let's look at the first question of this year that says the following materials were provided for titration experiments solution a containing 10.9 gram per dm cube of an acid h2y meaning that we don't know the type of acid we don't know this particular element y solution b containing 1.0 mole per dm cube of sodium trioxocarbonate 4 wash bottle containing distilled water and 250 standard volumetric flask with 25 centimeter cube by pet. So what would be the color? Let's, we, 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 the question has begun, so we, we now begin to answer the question practically, that what we have experimented visually, so we should now use the experiment, I mean the experience from our various experiments to answer this question. So the first question says, what would be the color of methyl orange in A? in A. So once an acid, once H is present, so definitely H is an acid. I mean H Y, H2Y is an acid. A is an acid. So an acidic substance, once methyl orange is dropped in it, it's going to be pink. So number one A, number A, one A, I, the answer is pink. And nothing to do with nothing more about that so the color of methyl orange in acidic medium is pink so now this ii says phenolphthalein in solution b that means what will be the color of phenolphthalein in solution b solution b is a weak base sodium trisocarbonate with n the formula says is na2co3 sodium trisocarbonate so the color of phenolphthalein in b will also be pink so with that from the practical experience, we are able to answer that. So now let's move to the next question. They say, outline a suitable procedure for preparing accurately 0.10 mole per dm cube solution of sodium trisocarbonate 4 using the materials provided. Meaning we are to use some materials provided, uh, the materials provided to produce a solution of 0.1 mole per dm cube. Of the solution. So, how are we going to produce 0.1 mole per dm cube of solution of trisocarbonate? Anyway, we are going to concentrate on the number of mass, I mean, the, the weight of the salt we are going to place in one dm cube that will make that will give us this particular concentration. You know, according to the formula, this is question B now. According to the formula, we know that molarity, which is which is molar concentration measured in mole per dm cube is equal to mass concentration over molar mass. And what do I mean by this? Mass concentration means the amount in gram of a particular salt that is present in one dm cube of the solvent. So dividing this mass concentration by the molar mass, you will get how many moles of that salt are there in the solution. 
So meaning that if I want to determine how much mass I'm going to measure in one dm cube, I will, I will have to use this molarity, which is equal to the mass conk x all over the molar mass. Don't forget, we are talking about Na2CO3. So meaning that we are going to have 2 times 23, that's the relative atomic mass of sodium, plus 12, that's that of carbon, then we have plus 3 times 16, that of oxygen. So we have 0 0.10 equals x over, that is 40, 46 plus 12 plus 48. So this gives uh, 60, that's 106. 0 0.10 equals x over 106. So x will be equals to x will be equals to 0 0.10 times 106. So that is 10.6. So meaning I am going to measure 10.6 gram gram per dm cube. So therefore, how we how are we going to prepare this solution? I'll say 10.6 gram of Na2CO3. Is measured and put into a volumetric flask. Volumetric flask is a flask used in producing standard solution. Then water is being added. Water is added, I mean to make it up to make up to 1000 centimeter cube so the volumetric flask is built in such a way that we have uh, it calibrated so once it is one once the lower meniscus of the solution has gotten to that marked point then it's 1000 centimeter cube correct so many measuring 10.6 gram per dm cube in 1000 centimeter cube we could produce 0 0.1 molarity. If you are not going to, if you are not meant to produce up to this 1000, maybe we just want to make 250, then we divide this mass into 4 and dissolve in 250, make up to 250. So that is how it is being done. Now, name two essential pieces of apparatus required for titration, which are not included in the list above. So we have pipette, we have volumetric flask, we have wash bottle. So, but we didn't have burettes. Burette is also part of it. We have beakers. We are meant to mention two, but I'm going to mention more than two. We also have funnel. We have conical flask. We have conical flask and so on, and a retort stand and so on. Those are the essential materials. Retort stand. To hold the bread. So these are the essential material that must be present if we are to carry out titration as an experiment. So let's look at the next question, question D. State five measures taken during titration experiment to ensure accurate results. There are a lot of measures we need to take during titration to ensure accurate results. One of it is ensuring that the, the burette is held tightly by the, by the clamp of the retort stand in order to avoid change in values or you are unable to measure your uh, readings very well and avoid parallax error in making use of the pipette and of the burette parallax error we should be familiar with that so if parallax error error in due to measurement of values on calibrations and you're meant to measure at straight space and you begin to look at different angles so and when taking measurement of the burette you concentrate on the lower meniscus lower meniscus is very important the lower meniscus of the burette is very important in taking measurement and we are meant to remove the tap when titration has begun why because once you once the tap is remained on the burette, it will keep topping up your burette 
believing that uh, you are titrating and you are reading your values but no once the tap is topping up your blue red then you won't get accurate results then another precaution or measures is do not wash the pipettes and uh, burettes with water when you wash them with or you rinse them with water by the time you add the solution they are meant to contain the water you use to rinse them will dilute more the, the solution thereby reducing the concentration so you might not get your accurate results so it's very important those are the precautions and secondly the conical flax should be rinsed with water and you are not meant to rinse it with acid or base so the exact volume of acid and base used will be what will be gotten accurately so those are the precautions then let's look at the next question that's the we have nothing much to write about that so let's look at the next question which is question which is question d no question e question e 22.5 centimeter cube of solution A, that means the volume of A used is 22.55 centimeter cube of A. Neutralized 25 centimeter cube of B, which is what? 25.0 centimeter cube, that's volume of the base. So, and the concentration of the base is 0 0.10 mole per dm cube of sodium carbonate which we have been given from the beginning of the question so the question says calculate the concentration of a in mole per dm cube so we are looking for ca ca which is the question mark then don't forget the equation of the reaction is very important in the calculation because it shows you the number of moles of a and b that reacted so we need to what take it into consideration plus h2o plus co2 so now from here i can see that the number of moles of the base b used number of moles of b is equals to one then a coefficient in the equation and number of moles of a is also one so using this formula the concentration of A times volume of A all over concentration of B times volume of B all equals number of mole of A over number of mole of B. So concentration of A is what we are looking for CA times VA which is 22.55 all over CB which is 25 times vb which is what 0.1 all equals 1 over 1 so we have 22.55 ca equals 25 times 0.1 will give us 2.5 2.5 2.5 which equals to 1 over 1 so cross multiplying we have 2.5 equals 22.55 CA. So our CA is going to be equal to 2.5 divided by 22.55. So that gives us 0 0.11 mole per dm cube. Um, don't forget that the number of mole in the equation is 1 1. If two reactants or acid and base or derivatives have equal number of moles in the equation so definitely their concentration they will take to uh, react should also be us close to each other that will make the titration so clear to explain so now we are meant to also determine the molar mass of acid don't forget we don't know the element y so we cannot easily say two times the molar mass of hydrogen plus the other elements so what we are meant to do is what we are meant to do is to use this same formula I used here. Now we know the molarity of the acid, which is the CA. We didn't know the mass concentration, or better still, we know it. It has been given in the question 10.9 gram per dm cube. That's good. 
10.9 gram per dm cube it has been given so from there we can just use this formula to determine the molar mass so since we know that ca will now be equals to mass concentration of a over molar mass of a so we are going to have 0 0.11 equals 10.9 over x so 0.11x equals 10.9 so from there i can just divide both sides by 0.11 so x will be what 10.9 over 0.11 So that gives 99.0, 99.01. So we cannot fish out the element. And if you are meant to fish out this element, what you have to do is to subtract the mass of hydrogen from this, which is just 2. So by the time you subtract that, the remaining mass will be for the element that is y. So that marks the end of question 1. That marks the end of question one. So let's move to the next question, which is question two. The next question, which is question two. Now, we are meant to answer this question, which is also a practical question. The question two says the A, 2A, give one test to distinguish between aqueous solution of calcium hydroxide and calcium trihalonitrate 5. Uh, we won't write much about this since it's based on explanation. What you're going to do is you're going to add a di add dilute HCl to the two to, to the solution of the two uh, uh, substances in a separate test tube. Once you do that, there will be differences. The differences is that the calcium trihalonitrate calcium trihalonitrate five, we have a vigorous effervescence. That means there will be evolution of gas. While in calcium hydroxide, there will be no visible reaction. So that has differentiated them. So we are meant to what add dilute HCl. To solution of CaOH2, which is calcium hydroxide, and CaNO32 in a separate test tube. In a separate test tube. What will be noticed? There will be vigorous, vigorous, sorry, vigorous effervescence, effervescence in CaNO3. But no visible reaction in CaOH2. So that has differentiated the two from each other. So then we move straight to the next question that says, state what would be observed performing the following test. So in order not to waste much of our time, so let's just go straight by saying, adding concentrated tetrasulfate 6 acid to a cube of sugar and then warming. So once you do that, what will happen is that you are going to see a black precipitate, a black precipitate of carbon. You know, sugar is made up of C6H12O6. Once that is done, what will definitely happen is, you know, in the addition of H2SO4, the concentrated one, imprecise, there will be dehydration of the sugar. The sugar will be dehydrated, so that means 6H2O will be removed. So we are going to have carbon as the precipitate, which is going to show the black color. So we are going to have 6C present, solid. 
so that will definitely happen so once the sequence once you add concentrated h2so4 to sugar and then you eat you are going to have a black precipitate which shows that what carbon has been uh, is the precipitate so now let's move to the second question under that warming a soil a sample of ion 2 sulfide with excess dilute hydrogen chloride. once you do this a colorless gas with the smell of rotten egg is evolved. A colorless gas with the uh, smell of rotten egg is evolved. So this results in uh, the solution to turn pale green. So let's just put the equation of the reaction FES solid plus 2HCl. So that gives us FeCl2 plus H2S. So the gases that comes out that gives the smell just like a rotten egg is this. So the pale green precipitate is as a result of FeCl2 that is produced. That is produced. So this is one of the this is the reaction and that was now let's move to the next question. Question three. Eating zinc transcarbonate four strongly and allowing the residue to cool what will happen in such case a colorless and odorless gas will be evolved the a colorless and that's first thing a colorless and odorless gas will be evolved and the colorless and odorless gas will be co2 that will be co2 because everybody we, we knew that zn co3 it contains what the uh calcium transcarbonates for a young. So once you eat this, CO2 will be evolved. We are going to have ZNO left plus CO2. So CO2 is the gas that is colorless, odorless, which is evolved in that reaction. And allowing the residue to cool, what we are going to obtain a, a yellow uh, precipitate. A, a yellow uh, in the first place before it cools, now we are going to have yellow. But by the time it cools from uh, from the odds as uh, uh, from from the odd one, we are going to have white precipitates produced. So according to the experiment, so the experiment must have been performed, or you, are, you must have been familiar with it before you can give your inference. So that is that on the question. So let's move to the last question in uh, two, which is question C. That is the major qualitative test we are to mention. So now. C is an inorganic salt of sodium, so that means meaning that C, sample C given to us will be NaX, which we don't know this particular anion present, but we know that the cation present is sodium. So since it has been stated inorganic salt of sodium, so the tests recorded in the table were performed as indicated. Copy and complete the table appropriately. So for the test, we have C plus water steer to rolling. What will be the observation? Most inorganic salt dissolves in water, so there will be what? Salt dissolves in water. So the answer to this space, we have the I. So the answer to this is salt dissolves, it dissolves in water. The salt dissolves in water. And what will be your inference? Salt is an insol is a soluble salt of sodium. Salt is a soluble salt of sodium. So that will be the inference. Salt is a soluble salt of sodium. Now C plus concentrated H2SO4 plus heat. Colorless gas with pungent smell. Evolved. Gas turned blue litmus paper red. Once a gas turned blue litmus paper red, which you know is an acidic gas. And give dense white foam with concentrated ammonia. Gases that give dense white foam when exposed to concentrated ammonia should be HCl, HCl gas, or Cl2 gas. HCl gas is the major one. HCl gas. So, on some special cases, Cl2 also does that. So, and they are both acidic gas. So, they are suspected at that moment. So now C plus H2SO4 plus MnO2 plus E. So in this, we discover that what? What will be the observation? 
we observe that a greenish yellow gas is evolved in this case a greenish yellow gas is evolved in this case so probably let me make the table so we can have a better look test observation and inference So we have C plus H2, which is water, plus TA. The observation is C dissolves in water. Then inference C is a soluble salt. Then the next one, C plus concentrated H2SO4 plus heat. The observation has been given to us. This is how alternative to particular looks like. The observation has been given to us as it is here. C plus concentrated H2 SO4 plus heat. So the observation is there. So I'm only going to fill the inference. So we suspect HCl and what? And Cl2 suspected. So C plus concentrated H2 SO4 plus manganese four oxide plus heat what are we going to notice we are going to notice that a greenish a greenish yellow a greenish yellow gas evolved such gas in this particular experiment the gas Bleaches. Bleaches wet blue litmus paper. And in this case also, um, to confirm this gas, this gas also turns starch iodide paper. Such iodide paper or just iodide paper, iodide paper black. So once this is confirmed, we know that the gas is what Cl2. And since the gas is Cl2, that means the cation present will be Cl minus. Cl minus. So the last test says aqueous solution of C. aqueous solution of C plus litmus. The observation will be no observable change in the litmus paper. There is no changes in the litmus paper, which shows that what? Which shows that C is a neutral solution. The aqueous solution of C is a neutral solution. So with this, we have completed the table and that would mark the end of the question two, of the question two. So let's look at question three. So the question three says, give one laboratory use of number one, Kipps apparatus. Kipps apparatus is used for the supply of gas, intermittent supply of gas, used for intermittent intermittent supply of gas that's the use of keeps apparatus so most of the questions only the ones that involve diagram and equations are we continue writing now so the bomb calorimeter is used to determine the heat of combustion of the substance accurately so that's just the use of this to this intermittent supply of some gases like chlorine s2 co2 and so on why bomb calorimeter is used to determine the heat of combustion of a substance accurately. So now we have another question that says, with the aid of label diagram, outline a suitable laboratory technique for separating a mixture of benzene and water. Given their what relative density at 20 degrees Celsius is this, 0.879 and 0.998. The relative density is close, showing that their boiling point 
is closed as well and we can look at another property that we be that we enable us to choose a, a suitable method for their separation both benzene and water are not miscible liquid they cannot miss they are immiscible liquid so in this case we can use separating funnel to separate them so how is that performed let me just sketch a diagram of that so we're going to have a retail stand So Rito stand used to add the separating funnel. So let's look at this schematic diagram. So when the two mixtures are introduced into the uh, separating funnel, water of the higher density will settle to the bottom and benzene will be at the top. So this is the beaker used to take the water. This is separating funnel. Separating funnel. This is water at the bottom. And this is benzene. And this is Richter stand. So water is also present here. So the water will be tapped off. That means the tap will be controlled to allow the water move. So once the layer of the water, there is a partition here. There will be a partition which coefficient could be calculated uh, using partition coefficient. So once the water is being tapped off, then we close the tap, remaining the benzene. So they've separated directly. Now that's question B. So let's move to C. A sample of air was passed over heated copper to heated copper and then bubble through lime water and then bubble through lime water before it was collected in a gas jar. Name the main constituent of air present in the fraction collected in the gas jar. That is nitrogen. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is collected. So once air is passed over heated copper and bubble through lime water, Nitrogen is being evolved. So now, state the component of air which reacts with the heated copper. With the heated copper, that's oxygen. Oxygen reacted. With the heated copper. Write an equation for the reaction and state the type of reaction involved. So the equation for the reaction is 2Cu solid. That's copper plus oxygen gas. That gives us 2CuO solid. And this reaction is oxidation. It's an oxidation process because it involves the transfer of two electrons from copper to oxygen because this is copper 2 oxide. And the accepting of electron by oxygen. So that explains oxidation and reduction. So we have another question that says, What change was observed on passing the sample of air over the heated copper? The color of copper changes. That would definitely be the, the, the effect. The color of copper changes from red to black. Yes, I think from red to black. From red to black. That is the answer. So, give the reason for each of the following laboratory processes. The first one says, preparing aqueous solution of ion 2 tetrasophase 6 just before they are required for use. Just it is to prevent the oxidation of the ion. Yes, you are meant to prepare it just before they are used immediately. Once you prepare, they are used immediately. You cannot prepare them ahead. That means ion, ion 2 tetrasophase 6. You cannot prepare it ahead of an experiment. 
Once you are to use ion 2 tetrahydrosis, you prepare it and use it instantly due to the oxidation of that compound. Now, evaporating organic solvents on water baths rather than by drying by direct heating. It is to prevent the oxidation. It is oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, that's a different question. Evaporation of organic solvent on water baths rather by rather than by direct heating. So organic solvent do evaporate easily on water baths so as to avoid the composition. You know, organic organic uh, solvents do decompose unlike the inorganic that doesn't decompose, they stay much longer than the organic. So uh, by direct eating, they might just you know decompose easily. But when you evaporate an organic solvent through water bath, the heat is going to be steady and you are going to get them so easily. But using a strong heat or direct eating, they might decompose straight away. So that marks the end of the uh, questions for the year 1993 thanks for watching please subscribe to our youtube channel it's free so we'll show you more videos thank you